Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Today's episode is with Politico's Alexander Ward. He has a new book out. It's called The Internationalist, The Fight to Restore American Foreign Policy After Trump. As you can tell from that title, this book is all about the Biden administration's foreign policy approach and the team of people within it leading out of 2021 after the presidential election. The book obviously is going to go into all the interesting reporting, the Afghan withdrawal, Ukraine, China, the trade wars, all those big issues obviously we cover in this conversation. But I think at a broader level, what I particularly enjoyed about Alex's book is its focus on how Trump's 2016 election really set the stage for how the Democratic Party's foreign policy establishment had to reassess its approach to the world after the Obama and Hillary Clinton years. Everything from, once again, those trade questions to the questions around NATO and U.S. engagement abroad are all covered here. So that central idea is really well worth exploring. It's one of the really interesting ways I think we're going to look back on this era of American politics. Once again, really recommend this book and obviously this conversation and a huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Alexander Ward, welcome to The Realignment. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I think the first interesting question to ask you about the book and your work is how much do you think foreign policy is going to matter? in the 2024 election? I mean, look, foreign policy is an elite sport. It rarely matters too much, right? I mean, domestic politics always tend to matter more, matters of economics, et cetera. Uh, I think the general maxim is this, though, that foreign policy can't really make a presidency, but it can break one. So in this case, foreign policy, you want to make sure you're just sort of managing the world and keeping chaos from arriving at America's shores. And in this case, you know, I think by the time I stopped, I stopped writing this book in roughly February, March of last year. And by then, you know, that was like, Kiev stands strong, stands proud, stands free. Ukraine was sort of on the up against Russia. And, you know, we didn't have the Israeli Hamas crisis. And, you know, there were, there are always issues around the world, but generally speaking, things were like kind of okay for America. Now things have gotten, uh, you know, a bit out of control. Um, you know, you can decide whether Biden is at fault for that or not, but either way, the fact that the world seems out of control, like I think that probably hurts Biden more than helps, right? And so I don't think people are necessarily pulling levers in November because of the foreign policy, but if there's chaos abroad, or especially if there's some massive failure um, that comes, you know, that could lead people to go, hey, maybe they don't have as much of a steady heel, uh, steady hand on the wheel as they claim. You know, you that was the perfect answer given the way you wrote the book, because you said, a second ago, quote, foreign policy is an elite sport. But the book literally starts with Jake Sullivan, obviously the NSA now, but very much then um, in 2016, 2017, really realizing the vulnerability the modern Democratic Party center latch really printing crew had when it came to foreign policy. They start trying to orient their vision much towards the middle class and the domestic side. Tell that story. Start the conversation there. Yeah. So look, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, as you noted, is next to Hillary Clinton as she's conceding to Trump. And he is someone who was his, her right hand man and has grown up in the traditional small, uh, you know, high, capital D Democratic foreign policy circles. Um, I'm used to saying small D, but in this case, capital <laughs> D uh, foreign policy circles. Um, and, you know, foreign policy is not necessarily is not why Trump won necessarily. But it was part of the story, or we should say he did not lose because of his foreign policy views. So Sullivan is thinking, you know, what did I miss? What did we miss? What have we gotten wrong about American foreign policy? And what he what he and others generally came to, and this is a, a broad sweep generalization, but they generally found was foreign policy is stronger when Americans feel like it works for them. Right? That it's in effect an extension of domestic policy. So just because you're doing free trade deals. And that does maybe lift, you know, the overall GDP of America. Uh, those effects might be ill felt in different, you know, might not be felt equally across the board or maybe even more theoretically, but not as not less important. Why should the nuclear umbrella be extended to South Korea? What does that matter to a coal miner in West Virginia? Or why should NATO matter to a farmer in Kansas or you know, that kind of thing? And so they tried to answer that. And in their minds, they, they any foreign policy action that is taken has to first and foremost go, well, what does that matter to that person in, in Scranton or in Boise or in Wichita? Uh, they have to have they have to have some sort of way to defend it. Now, 
critics would say, and I don't think wrongly, there's a lot of politics in this, right? Mm -hmm. um, domestic politics, you, you, because you want to say, hey, if we're going to go do this big thing abroad, well, you want to bring the people along and you also want to make people feel like they're they're benefiting from it. But I'll tell you, wh while I would agree there's politics to it, how often they talk about it and how often they think about some of their policies, they really are trying to keep it in mind. We can debate whether or not they've been successful, but it is something that is at their forefront. And I think we have to give tr credit here to a certain extent to uh, you know Trump's thinking, which is clearly infused Biden's thinking. And I, and I would go so far as to say is that the Biden administration's general intellectual underpinning of their foreign policy comes a bit from the trauma of having lost to Trump. Yeah, I guess what I'm interested in kind of debating with you then is your contention that Trump didn't win because of foreign policy. Because I actually think if you take us back to 2015 and kind of go down the line, okay, trade policy, deindustrialization message in the industrial Midwest, which helps him break through the blue wall um, in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. You then have the debates about building the wall, immigration. Um, obviously, like the border wall and then specific like uh, immigrant policies once they're in the country, that's a domestic issue. But look at how Kamala Harris, a huge part of her vice presidency, has been supposedly trying to handle um, the triangle countries in Central America, try to tamp down the roots of uh, migrant patterns, vowed or otherwise from there. So I'd love to hear your kind of articulation of why you think Trump won and why maybe that didn't have to do with foreign policy directly. I mean, look, I, I think directly is the point, right? We, maybe people thought foreign policy, Matt, people might have thought about foreign policy when they mattered. might have thought about immigration when they voted for Trump. They might have thought about economics when they voted for Trump. I, I, I don't want to attribute foreign policy as the reason why he won. Mm. It could be a reason why he won. So it's the directly that, that, I'm, that I'm noting. Uh, but there's no question. I mean, like the overall Trump message was the elites have gotten it wrong forever on the Democratic and Republican side. It has not worked for you, the regular person of America. And I'm going to go to Washington to rectify that and make sure I have you in mind. Again, can debate whether or not Trump was was genuine when he meant that or when he said that or his policies. But that's a through line from Trump to Biden. Right. A foreign policy for the middle class, as the Biden team articulates it, is a more sort of packaged version of what Trump was saying. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so there is a lot of Trumpism in Bidenism. Uh, I think Biden seemed to prefer, I would say, populism. <laughs> uh, but they, but there is a lot of Trump's ideas infused in Biden's ideas. And this is, uh, you know, not necessarily an aberration. There's always been a lot of continuity between administrations, regardless of how different they are. Um, so the fact that there's some continuity is not in and of itself sort of noteworthy, but it's noteworthy when you consider who Trump and Biden are. They are polar opposites of the American foreign policy thinking and experience, right? Biden is kind of a one-man red team of the post-1945 consensus. Biden is the avatar of it. And yet they have maintained a lot of things that are event that are essentially this whole, like, you know, America can do what it wants around the globe and or globalization and all that kind of stuff. That hasn't worked out so well. We've got to reel that back. That again, they got they basically had the same diagnosis of the issue. They're, you know. So their cures were very different, but that is a through line. And I and I think Bi as much as Biden's team necessarily wants to like separate themselves from it, they they can't. They they I, I more simply put, you do not get a foreign policy for the middle class unless Trump wins, right? You do like they are they are of a piece. I think what's interesting here because I've spent a lot of time with the intellectual crowd within the Biden. Um, the administration. So the people who are saying foreign policy for the middle class, thinking about ideas like the care economy, Bidenomics, like that whole sort of thing. And I think for a lot of folks, it's hard to separate the marketing from the actual fact that there's an intellectual construct here. So let's let's take listeners' skeptical hats off for a second. When they yeah. say there's a foreign policy for the middle class, and you argue in many ways it's infused with let's say, taking the positive sides of Trumpism, what does that practically mean in terms of the course of the past four years? So I think perhaps the most vivid example would be on Ukraine, right? Uh, when they make the case for why you defend Ukraine the way they're doing, they make two gen general arguments. One is a bit more broad, one is a lot more specific. The broader one is, uh, if you don't stop Russia in Ukraine, Russia will eventually at some point down the line, maybe immediately, maybe down, maybe further, attack a NATO country, in which case that requires 
the United States to send America's sons and daughters abroad to fight Russia. And then that war is a lot more expensive and a lot more deadly uh, than this fight where we're effectively backing the Ukrainians to fight the Russians, where we're not directly militarily involved, which leads to point two, which is the more targeted one where they where they go. Yeah. And their messaging has been bad on this, by the way, when they say we've sent billions in aid to Ukraine. Yes, there's economic aid and other things that have paid for uh, the economy and the government of Kiev. But a lot of it is the worth of the weapons that we have sent. Mm -hmm. And so what they're saying is, look, we're going to replace these older weapons we're sending to Ukraine with newer weapons for the American military, which helps our government, uh, our military be stronger. And who's making those weapons? People in Mississippi and in Arkansas and Kansas and, and Texas and Alabama. And so there's a genuine middle class tangible benefit to this strategy in the way we're helping Ukraine. You can debate that all you want, <laughs> like this, mm -hmm. right? But that is how they talk about it, and that is how they genuinely think about it. There is politics involved, right? Again, I don't want to deny that. Um, and, and we should just note, it's almost a blanket statement, any government that does anything, there's always politics involved, Yes, right? But like that doesn't necessarily take away from either the, the genuineness of it, or at least the intention of it, which is there has to be some sort of or let's put it this way. When Jake Sullivan goes to the podium, he has to be able to say, I know how this helps you, the person looking at me through the camera. And if they don't have that, then the policy doesn't sing. Something I would love to get your thoughts on. Um, I'm really fascinated in the category of things that the Biden team clearly picked up from Trump um, is the continued focus on China. Because I think there's a there's there's almost certainly a world. This is not even that difficult of a counterfactual to establish here, where Inauguration happens. Let's put aside January 6th for a second. Inauguration happens. And the Biden folks say the following. Trump was tough on China, soft on Russia. Russia is this threat. Russia interfered in our election. China is this country that ultimately we've been partners with since the Cold War. So much of what Trump did from the Kong flu comments to all of the back and forth was racist and xenophobic. And of course, he pursued a tariff policy that hurt American farmers in the Midwest. Let's instead focus on Russia and then go soft on China. The Biden administration very discernibly did not go soft on China. Everything from uh, basically backing up the declaration uh, about Uyghurs um, and their treatment to, once again, the trade policy and in many ways ratcheting it up um, with the sanctions on the chips industry. What happened there basically from 2017 to 2021 that convinced the Biden wing of the Democratic Party to continue going hard on China when, once again, you didn't have to get there and there are political reasons to not have done so? Because uh, it worked. <laughs> I mean, like, it worked. Uh, now, granted, well, quick thing, Biden, you know this, you know this, you're a political reporter. There are many things that work in our politics and folks that follow up on. So it's interesting that like it working from 2017 to 2021, that's still continuing. Um, that I wouldn't say that's the norm when it comes to a lot of these policy matters. Right. Well, look, I mean, the, take this for what it's worth. But Biden's team took great pride in the early months of the administration to re to reignite the sort of general interagency process in which they were trying to generally figure out like which policies worked and which didn't mm -hmm. and if they work continue them or you know tweak them if they need be and if they didn't work find a whole new way and on the tariffs they, it was more the tweak they were like look trump was right the chinese have been uh not playing nice in global economics for years, stealing intellectual property, hurting American business, hollowing out in the manufacturing base. So some of these tariffs make sense. Mm -hmm. Some of them, some of them just do. And 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 pushing back on China and the economic sphere with export controls and and all other bunch of methods, all that makes sense. There is more that can be done. And perhaps the biggest change was Biden teams thought uh, Biden's team thought. You know, Trump kind of went at it alone, and that was pretty effective. It's probably more effective if we get allies on board to also counter China. And that's a pretty significant uh, change, but it's coming from the same place. So, you know, they in this case, they were just and, and also we should note the politics of it, right? It does not look good to be soft on China these days. Mm -hmm. So they had to maintain something. But I think when you listen to Biden's rhetoric, what their whole point is like, we're not going to let you get away with everything, but we don't want this to get out of control. So we're going to push back on you where we need to. And this worked for Russia as well. By the way, that was their general, general vibe. Like, we're going to push back on you when we need to. 
And we're not going to be afraid of that. But we're going to always leave the door open to talk and to cooperate where we need to be. This doesn't need to be like wholly antagonistic or wholly friendly. There can always be a lot of gray, gray area here. And so I think they tried to gray area of the China policy a bit, not to necessarily make it friendlier, but to make it more nuanced uh, and, and, and less antag and less sort of rancorous rhetorically than, than with Trump. But they did come they did come from the same place, which was it was long past time uh, to push back on China. And, and look, Trump's credit, like the bipartisan consensus on on China is like in large part due to his. His thinking so it was whether biden wanted to change he didn't but like whether if he ever wanted to the politics in dc were such that he wouldn't have been able to do that anyway that's fascinating i think another big question that it really matters here to your point um so much of the first part of the book before biden's election is about how like the big capital d democratic party foreign policy apparatus thinks about foreign policy what would you say is the traditional establishment uh, Democratic Party foreign policy viewpoint right now during this, once again, this is the name of the, po the podcast, during this realignment where clearly everyone knows you can't go back to the 2014 Obama consensus. And in many ways, with Hillary Clinton jettisoning um, TPP and Bernie Sanders, you'd already were moving away from that, whether or not Trump won. Where have things kind of settled in 2024? Yeah, and, and I should note, like, uh, you know, I think that the, the realignment on foreign policy has happened most intensely under Trump and under Biden, but it started kind of under Obama, or even somewhat so after the failure of the Iraq War, people going, wait a minute, this ain't working, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get Obama after that. So maybe you could make the case for Bush, but unintentionally, but then intentionally kind of from Obama on, but more intensely in these last two. Anyway, uh, to, your, to, your, to your good question, I think at this point, it's a lot more continuity than change. I don't necessarily want to overstate how much traditional democratic foreign policy has changed, right? But it has, and even small small shifts in a policy that's been in place for 70, or for seven decades, for 70 years, matters, Yeah. right? So in this case, the small shift has really turned away from, let's say, free trade and globalization. There's still support for liberal national order and, and, and you know, the, the free flow of, of goods around the world. But no, it's no, no longer as much like if we just help other countries, then they become part of the system and we all go together. There's now a, a, a belief that, like, you can help China all you want and you can try to engage them all you want, but they may still be antagonistic. Mm -hmm. And so now there is a now there is a clawing back of that engagement, which towards China specifically since Nixon, but frankly, towards other countries. So I think that's sort of the bigger shift is that free trade globalization, you know, that whole sort of uh, the TPPs of the world, that's no longer where we are. Um, there's also not that there's ever been necessarily like a major appetite historically in, in America for war or for military action. But it's now really hard um, to get to get uh, Americans really behind it, uh, behind some sort of bigger effort. They might be behind targeted special operations or like killing terror or something like that, um, or really, again, limited defined missions. But these sort of like broader America goes in and saves the day missions, there just isn't that support there. Doesn't mean they won't be pushed forward, but there is like Democratic and Republican uh, kind of horseshoey, but still, um, you know, a transpartisan view like this, you know, we can't just be doing this all the time. So I think those are, that last one's more like a, an ideological tonal shift. The other one is, is a lot more tangible. I think the rest has been most, I mean, I, we don't have the time to go into it all, but generally speaking, most of the same, but those are the two I think that have changed the most and will affect our politics uh, going forward. So, you know, if I were to put a tombstone on traditional U.S. foreign policy thinking, I think I'd put it towards the end, you know, end of Bush, start of Obama, and now we're in this new era. And frankly, as we head into November 2024, like whoever wins at this point, it seems like Trump uh, or Biden are going to be the two, like they have a major say in how this, this goes. And so when voters go to the polls, I still don't think foreign policy is going to matter too much. But indirectly, they will kind of be pulling the lever for, I want it to go one way or the other. So this is a pretty major inflection point in US foreign policy history, in, in my view. What do you think, and this is just the, if we're gonna say that there's a tombstone from basically 20, 
2011, because that's after the first with Iraq withdrawal um, up until Trump's election. There's something afterwards that emerges. Uh, a lot of folks have described this moment as a second Cold War. The Biden administ administration framing is like authoritarian powers versus democratic powers. How would you describe the dynamics of today's moment, which clearly both parties have not formed a consensus around, but just how would you describe the dynamic that needs to be diagnosed? Well, I think Biden's team has a general sense. Um, I don't think they would call it a Cold War. I know people have, and I think there's genuine reasons to, to for people to believe that. I And I understand their authoritarian frame. I think in this sense, I think this is actually a discussion about how much do values need to matter. Okay. Right. Because when you talk about American foreign policy, sort of grand strategy, it's usually um, security, economics, values. Right. And by values, you usually mean democracy and the promotion of it. Now, granted, America has always talked a big game about global democracy and we haven't always lived up to it. Right. So that's that's but set that aside for a moment. There's the there's a discussion about who cares what, how the Saudis act or who cares you know, what, like who the president of Argentina is, are they going to work with us in a way that advances the American interest? Then we're, we're going to do it mm -hmm. regardless. And we're not going to do these like backroom, whatever things we're going to try to promote democracy or, you know what I mean? Like, um, like the, 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 the Mike McFalls of the world, right. The foreign ambassador of Russia, who now sort of feels like diplomacy should always be about strengthening the, the, the the small D democratic core in a country to rise up over time, like that is sort of being questioned mm -hmm. uh, more than before. So I think everyone wants their security, right? Everyone wants to be prosperous. That's all well and good. It's this third pillar that I think is actually the one that people are, are questioning. And to hear when Biden talks about authoritarians versus de Democrats, small D Democrats, okay. um, he means that as... Like that, the values pillar matters, and and when you hear Trump talk about it, he's just being like, "Look, that I'm going to make a deal with these these nations, regardless, because there are people who could use the business. There are people who are hurting, and like, why would I deny an investment of cash into the United States, or why would I deny um, of the pursuit of a certain goal abroad uh, with this country just because like I don't like their government?" Now, again, that's we've had those general views throughout our history, but that's kind of what we're debating here in the meta narrative, and so. This is the, let's say, the internationalist versus the nationalist divide. Um, and Biden's team is unabashedly the internationalists. And it looks like they're going up against almost as if I drew it up, cartoonishly speaking, um, like the, the nationalist counter argument, which is why, again, I think like this November election um, is very much like you are, whether or not you're thinking about it, pulling the lever for one of those worldviews or the other. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, given the title of the book is the the internationalist, what you're going to try to see happen. And this is, and once again, this is why the debate about how much foreign policy in elections matters is interesting. If Biden can win re-election, there will be a there will be a there will be evidence that what the internationalists were able to do is take the parts of the nationalist critique that were valid, um, and and you actually kind of you kind of see this right in the you know winning back Wisconsin. Um, in 2020, like winning back Pennsylvania, um, that key part there um, really matters. So now I want to kind of go um, hotspots around the world, issue by issue, as you kind of catalog in the book. So obviously, to your point, you'd finish this book before the uh, you know 10-7 um, and the latest like Israel-Hamas-Gaza conflict. But there was a conflict in 2021, which I don't think got that much play relative to obviously what's happening now. But I think also in many ways, if you actually look at the story, the what actually ended up happening is kind of confused people in certain ways. So the way I kind of hear his story, um, folks who said something like Biden called Bibi and then Bibi stopped shelling because Biden told him to. And from my perspective, it's like, look, if you don't understand the difference between the Israeli reactions between 10-7 and what was happening in 2021, that explains why that just make a call option just isn't there to the same degree. So can you kind of unpack what was happening in 2021 and how you think it shapes in the story you tell how we should perceive Biden's options in 2024? Yeah, I mean, in that so that wasn't that whole conflict. I mean, look, there have been tons of spats between Israel and Hamas before, right? So in Biden, the Biden's team mind, the way we get that we get that fight to stop soonest is we say, Israel, you're doing right, defend yourself. You shouldn't be attacked. Any nation should be able to defend itself. 
And then in private, be like, but do what you got to do to end this as soon as possible. Now that, again, people, you know, people die. There was, there was destruction, but it ended after 11 days and team Biden credited their like hug in public critic, you know, push in private strategy as being helpful. And uh, the, for those, you know, you'll see it in the book, but the, the public rhetoric escalated over time. And so there was kind of like a rat, a slow ratcheting up. That was deliberate. And it also helped uh, by in Biden's team's mind uh, that there were progressives more willing to call out Israeli actions. And so Biden could go to BB and be like, look, you're losing the Democrats. So you've got to kind of cut this out now. So this this ends in 11 days and, and the White House kind of goes like, look, this strategy, really, we nailed it. Like, so October uh, 7th pops up. It is, of course, far too different uh, than, than, than 2021. But they kind of employ the same playbook. Like Biden and literally. Quick, though, and the key thing, the yeah. key quote that folks really pick up from the 2021 incident was Biden telling BB, you're out of runway. So I think maybe the way to think about this is in 2021, the runway is only so long. The issue for Biden now is that the runway from the Israeli perspective is clearly much, much, much longer. But go on. No, no, that, 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 I'm, I'm so glad you interjected. That, that's totally that's totally right. And, you know, so so they try the same playbook basic, basically now. And Bibi's going, look, look, we just lost 1,200 people in a, in a brutal, brutal way. The the Israeli public is may not like me, but they are on my side in this campaign against Hamas. And so as much as Biden is, you know, saying you, know, you got to care about civilians and all that, Bibi's first job is to go after Hamas because that's what his people are saying. Now, we've got already stats that the Israelis are taking pains to care about civilians and that they've done pretty well, historically speaking, of protecting civilians. Um, although, of course, we cannot deny the fact that about 28,000 as of the point that we're talking here have been killed and there's immense suffering in Gaza. We cannot deny that. Uh, but all this to say is that, you know, the Biden play to literally go to Israel, hug Bibi, but then quietly be like, hey, what can you do to start to start de-escalating? There's not as much leverage here. I mean, in a sense, Bibi has already, quote unquote, sort of lost the Democrats, right? There, I mean, You've now got people calling for the end of, or at least restrictions on military aid, calling Israeli leaders war criminals, like, there, there's no threat to lose the Democrats. You've lost the Democrats. Uh, you can imagine in their oh, mind. Sorry, let's let's pause there too, because this really matters. Yeah. So once again, political realignments, this is what I focus my time on. Interesting fact here is what part of the Democrats, you're talking about a coalition, because one of the things that happens during the Trump years is the Democrats really pick up seats, but also frankly, like party identity in center left to center right suburbs. So yes, you do have the squad, the AOCs of the world, um, Rashida Tlaib obviously saying things like genocide, saying things like, well, guess what? Um, you know, we need to stop sending these um, weapons packages. But you also have Fetterman, who's like picking up favorability with these moderate voters. So when you just say, um, you know, BB or Israel's lost Democrats, like what part of the party do you think has been lost to Israel? And does it matter um, long term? from a national like election perspective. No, I, I appreciate you asking for specificity there. I mean, definitely more the progressive wing, but some centrist leaning folks. I mean, not a lot, but some are more willing to at least question and think about, um, you know, whether the, the, the policy towards Israel should be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, but it is mostly, for, it, the energy is mostly on the progressive end, but, but it was still to say that Biden, you know, in 2021 was like, look at my progressive wing, BB, be careful. And now Bibi's like, yeah, I know, I know where they're at, like whatever, you know. Um, but we still cannot discount the fact that his, you know, government is his, what his government is at this point, and he's got a public that, even though they may not like him personally these days, appreciates the military campaign against him. So Biden's leverage here is not so strong. Other than when you hear the the administration talk about it, they say, well, Israel would have gone far more all in if it were not for us. Um, and Israel, or at least the world, cares more about the humanitarian issue because we bring it up constantly. We push them to open up uh, crossings, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. The the what you know, it, the, the, they're they are comparable in the sense that it is Israel Hamas, but they are not exactly the same conflict. But what I found, in, what I've been finding interesting, mm. is that on a larger scale, Biden has been using that 2021 playbook here. Yeah, and I think the real test for Biden is. 
the 2021 playbook worked given the coalition he had. What's seriously up for debate is that a political, what's put aside is really policy level. It seems clear, and once again, who trusts polls these days? So I'm not going like, to make any bets based on that. But clearly, there are parts of the Democratic Party's coalition, especially in important states like Michigan, who are not satisfied with the hug in public, um, be aggressive in private strategy. Um, so that's to be one of those questions, which clearly isn't going to be resolved, I think, beforehand. Um, but it's going to be up for um, up for debate in uh, November. So, okay, so next topic. So to your point at the start of the conversation, generally speaking, foreign policy is not going to take the lead here. But what's so interesting is if you look at Afghanistan, all out there, that's an example of a play that would seem to meet this Trumpian post-2015 moment. Forever wars exhaustion when it comes to military engagements, a lack of our ability to articulate an end game that doesn't mean we're just in Afghanistan to 2100. All those facts, this is something that Biden has been very serious about ever since 2009. He was really, to your point, the red team person in the Obama administration. However, his polling decline really started then. So it's this real, like, do if, I don't want to say do if you don't, um, you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't, because there were some like mistakes they were quite literally made here, but kind of like unpack like the mix of policy and political dynamics that emerged from Afghanistan and what happened with the withdrawal from Kabul in your reporting. Yeah, I mean, look, Biden, everyone knew what Biden wanted when he came in. He wanted out. That, that was well known. And it he had a ready made excuse, let's say, in the Trump Taliban deal that required the U.S. to, to withdraw, basically. And Biden, I think, genuinely felt it is a deal the U.S. government has made, therefore I should honor it. But also, yippee, it agrees with what I wanted, uh, which was to leave. I think when we talk about Afghanistan, I, I have a very, un unfortunately, almost over-nuanced answer, which no, no, satisfies no one. But I think we have to hold two pretty competing thoughts in our head. That withdrawal was immensely chaotic and did not need to be as chaotic. And it was pretty impressively improvised and well executed. They seem at odds, but that's because this is a very tough one. Let's start with the improvised part first, because I think that's just what we don't talk about enough. The intelligence that Biden made the decision to leave on, other than that he wanted to leave, was that they had 18 to 24 months before the Taliban would take over Afghanistan. That's, that's when the decision was made. That's what they had in their heads. That's what they were told. So other things that they're working on, how, to, how the military withdrawals, getting uh, Afghan allies out of Afghanistan, withdrawing U.S. diplomats, et cetera, all of that is on that timeline. Of course, as we all know now, the Taliban sweeps to power very quickly, and the U.S. and allies are scrambling. How do we get the troops out? How do we get all these people out? And they pull off the greatest airlift in, in man-made in man history, right? 124,000 or so people removed in pretty quick succession, not not um, without fault, right? We saw 13,000 troops killed. We saw horrible scenes of people- You mean 13, 13, 13 troops killed. Oh, what did I say? 13,000. Oh my goodness, oh yes. <laughs> yeah, greatest is, yeah. Sorry, sorry. sorry, 13, thank you, thank you. 13 uh, US uh, service members killed. People, uh, you know, people falling out of airplanes trying to escape. Thousands outside the airport in, in just horrible conditions were trying to work their way in to get on flights. Um, but they still got a bunch of people out and they left some folks behind, which takes us to the chaos point. I mean, because of that collapse, the, even with the great improvisation, generally speaking, it looked worse than it had to be. It was worse than it had to be. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think anyone seriously believes that there could have been a perfect, clean you know, a withdrawal of a war we were involved in for 20 years when you had the Taliban doing what it was going to do. Mm -hmm. But it didn't have to be that chaotic. And we saw how bad it, it got. And so I think when you, when one of your arguments when you were Biden then and still somewhat now is the adults are back in the room. We are doing this well. We are the foreign policy professionals. And you're like, that's the best you can do. Yeah. That's the best America can do. I don't, it makes sense why Americans would look at that and go, look at how bad that was. And I think the same, I bet if you ask most Americans, and I agree with you, polling is tough these days, but I bet if you put a beer in front of them and you said, was it the right decision to leave? I bet they would say yes. And they say, but did we have to leave that way? And they'd go, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I think that's the nuance we have to keep in our head that there, that the, the war was not working. Biden was going to go. That's what was going to happen. 
And I think generally speaking, most Americans would agree that was not a war that needed to continue. But they also didn't want America to leave a war like that. Yeah. And that they wish they could plan for it to that they wish it could have gone better. And so I think we always have to hold that dichotomy in our head. Uh, and we also have to give props to the way they left. And we also have to criticize them for the way they left. So I know I over nuanced this to death. But I think it's very important because this is what I struggled with the most is I wanted to narratively give some sort of clean storytelling answer. And there's just a bit of muddle in the book. You've read it um, because I think there is muddle. I don't think there is actually a clean story here. I'm, I am I hear partisans on each side saying it was, you know, especially usually Republicans going, that was chaotic. That was a true failure. And Democrats go look at the greatness and look at the war we ended. And like both are wrong in my view based on the reporting like they they're or at least not wrong but they're missing an important element of the story they're only telling half truths at best yeah and related to this point then i think like i i appreciated you framing the trump era mm -hmm. as a period where capital d democrats are trying to find like the answer to like the big question aka like how do you reduce republican gains in the industrial uh, midwest and with working class voters it seems to me a question that emerges from the biden administration i'd love to hear your thoughts on if you are a smart young democrat you basically have to think about the following democrats are are really um selling the parties the party of normalcy um, that's why suburban voters feel safe. We're not the party of Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene. We're definitely not the party of Trump. Like we're the normal ones. However, the world is by definition not normal right now. Um, everything from you're going to have COVID, you're going to have a war in Ukraine start, you're going to have Gaza, you're going to have Houthi rebels launching uh, missile strikes and like drone strikes and boat strikes against global shipping, potential Taiwan conflict. So on the one hand, Democrats have to say that they're the party of normalcy. But on the other hand, the universe and the world and the narrative are just throwing unnormal things at them, which means that when you're pitching yourself as the normalcy party, I get the sense you're going to be punished for these things more than Trump. Because with Trump, I feel as if the chaos is built in to what you're kind of selling there. It's like, look, that's like, and you see, and this is polling, I do believe, the polling where a decent percentage of voters rate Trump better on foreign policy or a bunch of these like different categories, because even if they they know that Trump's chaotic, they're not going to hold that chaos against him quite the same way. Like, for example, they didn't react um, to the assassination of Soleimani, um, you know, the, the IRGC. I think the way they would have reacted to, um, let's say, Joe Biden. Right? So if Joe Biden like assassinated a Iranian military figure right now, I do not think that would like rebound well to him. Um, from a like, this is chaos, this is scary perspective. I'm curious, like, what you think about this normalcy and unnormal world uh, issue? Yeah, it's like, I haven't, I can't say I thought too much about this, but I will try to do informed guesses throughout. I mean, we have seen Biden kill people, like, back, you know, um, terrorist leaders, and recently a Katate Hezbollah leader. I know it's not on the same level as Soleimani. Um, but look, I mean, actually, let's put it this way. Like Trump did red team things intentionally and unintentionally, like moving the embassy to Jerusalem and Israel. Right. Uh, there was people thinking like this could start off just a region wide conflict. I don't want there was you know, there was some there, there were protests. There was a little bit of chaos. There were deaths uh, afterward. But it wasn't the major flare up that everyone feared after Soleimani, there was, you know, the sense that like the, the U.S. and Iran were going to go to war. There was, you know, there were attacks on the on regional embassies and there was a bit of a flare up. But at the end of the day, OK, it's kind of the status quo. And you took a big player off the board. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's necessarily like it's a Trump chaos thing. I think it was just he made some bets and they didn't, you know, pun and not pun unintended, but like blow up in his face. Mm -hmm. Um you know, Biden in this case, he sort of, well, maybe, may, sorry, maybe you do a, a point here. I'm just saying, I'm literally thinking through it live. Yeah. Because it's a podcast. This is the format. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm thinking through it because, like, in a sense, you know, Biden's whole shtick is I, like steady hand at the wheel. Like, we, we've got this under control. So, any sense of things getting out of control sort of, sort of hurts him. But I think that also hurt Trump. I mean, there were tons of people who were criticizing the way the world kind of, you know, didn't go super great necessarily when he was president. I mean, we didn't necessarily see tons of major flare ups like this, but like it wasn't all perfect. We we were worried about nuclear war with North Korea, lest we forget. Right. Mm -hmm. um, 
would, of course it didn't happen um and maybe he deserves credit for getting to diplomacy with kim but kim jong-un but like whatever anyway i don't really have a good answer to this question so i probably but, but um and it's a good one i should think more about it but I, I i guess i come down on the point of no one wants to see chaos regardless maybe there's a built-in buffer for trump right like if he gets in uh, this is out of my wheelhouse but if he gets indicted for things People are like, I don't know. well, yeah, he gets indicted for things. And even if Biden gets exonerated, but there's something in there that doesn't look good, like her calling him, you know, old and senile, and people are like, oh man, that's bad for him. So we're in a world where Trump gets exonerated and he's it helps him, and uh, or you know, gets indicted and it helps him, and Biden gets exonerated and it doesn't help. Um, so maybe that applies to foreign policy too, but I don't think so. I think people generally on foreign policy would go, just keep things as steady as it can be. At writ large, just kind of keep us, the U.S., out of it. Uh, we can be involved in the world. We can talk to allies. We can do stuff, but just don't let don't let there be blowback. I think that's kind of the through line here. I think uh, speaking of realignment themes that I'm really fascinated by, I think when we take a look back at this decade, I think a dynamic that's really going to matter politically from a coalitional perspective is Democrats are clearly becoming the party. I don't want to say, but more hawkish, but definitely the party that's more bought into the U.S. foreign policy status quo in a way that I clearly think the AOCs and squad members of the world were not necessarily like prepared for um, in the sense that it's clearly Democrats are taking the lead on pushing through Ukraine, um, Taiwan aid, um, et cetera. Um, the Israel one's complicated, um, but clearly, and you, but so like, and, and for example, like AOC recently, you know, indicated that she would vote against, uh, you know, the House funding because she couldn't support the, uh, you know, the fact that some of the aid would go to Israel and that could lead to deaths in Gaza. When I saw that, I thought like, man, like there's a world where those types of votes are the types of votes she's going to take that are really going to harm her in a Democratic primary. Um, in a war where, once again, the Democratic Party is becoming much more like it's like pre-Vietnam self. I um, mean, it's in the sense, once again, that it like it owns U.S. foreign policy. Um, so can you kind of just like talk about this dynamic? Because like even like think about Lindsey, Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham voted against um, this the aid in the Senate when, when in many ways, if we were to kind of do this conversation in 2013, we'd say, oh, man, Lindsey Graham, like he's foreign policy. Like his whole 2013 campaign was foreign policy first. I'm the uber hawk, like neoconservatism light. Talk about this shift um, that's clearly, that that really sort of revved up. Um, there, there were hints of it in um, Trump's first term, but I think the China focus meant that that was kind of papered over. But clearly the Ukraine issue was just turning this up on steroids. So let's hear about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly what he said, but Lindsey Graham, when he was running for president, had a line that was like, if you don't want to go to war, don't vote for me. Like, yeah, yeah like that. That, that's, here's the thing, <laughs> that, that, that isn't the direct quote, but that's the sense, he wanted you as a reporter to yeah. have that be the takeaway from a brand Yeah, yeah, and like, that's, that was, you know, I, I remember thinking like, you know, for a guy who's polling at 1%, he's really saying a lot of things about how you should vote for him, but anyway, <laughs> um, I, look, I, I think it goes back to the main point, frankly, of the book, and I think of our era, which is the Democrats will be hurt for being less internationalist, and Republicans won't be hurt for being less internationalist. They will be rewarded for being more nationalist. Now, that's generally speaking, and I think we have to note that there are lots of Republicans who want more Ukraine aid and, and of course, support for Israel, a lot of Democrats that want that, too. I don't want to overstate necessarily the differences, but the political incentives are different, generally, right? At this point, because Trump is the head of the Republican Party and he it, and he is against this aid bill, it empowers his ideological allies. And of course, it puts Speaker Mike Johnson in a tough spot, it puts Mitch McConnell, uh, Senate Minority Leader, in a tough spot. So the political incentive heading into an election, also having Trump about, is just different. Even though I think there's a lot more traditional foreign policy thinking in the Republican Party than than gets covered and then is thought about because Trump's in charge. Whereas with Democrats now is like not helping Ukraine or whatever is like somehow embracing a sense of Trumpism mm -hmm. or instead or embracing a sense of um, nationalism where some people just have genuine disagreements over uh, uh, supporting for their war or whether you really believe that Israel is no longer a country that deserves the kind of uh, usually rubber stamp military assistance that we provide. 
like that's all that's all well and good but like you can be hurt for that more than i think you can be in the republican party so i i, I don't necessarily want to predict this or, or oversimplify it but like i think if you sort of take trump out right and replace him with a nikki haley or a mitt romney or or you know mike mccall or someone like that like then the political incentives are different because that person believes in this more traditional sense and then you can follow that party so it's just kind of like how do you navigate a world where there are people who, who, who enough people in Congress who on the Republican side who agree with Trump. And you, even though, you know, I think the majority of the party would, would uh, agree with that more traditional framing. So it just, it causes all kinds of um, tough foreign policy, uh, you know, calculations. And of course on domestic politics too. But uh, I, I think that's more of the issue. It's just the messages from the top complicate the rank and file. So here is the big last question. You're recording this um, at the Munich Security Conference. So Europe is an incredibly important question. It seems that if we're going to look at a probable or possible Trump presidency, decisions around Europe and NATO are clearly going to be at the forefront of what's going to really matter there. What is the mood in Europe as to the 2024 election that you're picking up there? Uh, it's early for me, uh, or it's actually late for me here, but early in my time here in Munich. Oh, um, so yeah, okay. I want to make you be Thomas Friedman. You you get into the cab, and the cab driver <laughs> gives you a perfect paragraph of prose. What does he right. tell you? <laughs> uh, I mean, look, I, but I think generally, I've talked to European officials a lot, and I think the general view here is, you know, Trump's bark is worse than his bite. Like he, his comments about, you know, he'll welcome Russia to invade a NATO country if they don't pay enough. Like that is more the, you know, take him seriously, not literally thing in the sense of, no, he would not welcome Ru a Russia invading a, a NATO nation. He would push back or at least his, his administration would push back. But he's really trying to scare the Europeans into spending more. And that, of course, unnerves people because that is a naturally destabilizing thing to no longer see America's, you know, almost... Uh, automatic support kind of no matter what whereas biden is a rock ribbed traditional transatlanticist and he will stand by out he yes he would like the europeans to spend more but he prioritizes uh alignment and he prioritizes tie, you know, having ties and and improving ties and and with allies you can do more and so it's not like he's you know not paying attention to the spending issue i'm sure more quietly there are pushes from uh, the U.S. Uh, to to get NATO countries to spend more. And now I believe more than half, according to NATO's own figures, it's like 18 out of 31 are now spending the 2% the, the of GDP. Still nowhere near enough, but, you know, it's been more. Um, I think they think that that's working. That's sort of, you know, showing that America is there for you will encourage you to, to spend more, where Trump's is, theory is literally the opposite. If you show that America is not there, then they have no choice but to spend more. Um, you know, we'll see which one's more effective perhaps, but, um, I think the, and yes, you do have some, I will, you know, some European allies who are especially, uh, more concerned about Ukraine are definitely worried about what, what a Trump presidency means. Cause they think that Ukraine will not get as much support, um, as, as much as they will from Biden. Um, but then again, you have Putin saying, you know, Biden would be better than Trump <laughs> for Russia. So, you know, these weird moments. Um, but anyway, I think there's a sense of, you know, Trump is sounds worse than he is, but on Ukraine, there's a lot more concern. Uh, and I think there's a preference for Biden there, but but who who, who knows? Um, but there's no question that this conference that I'm at is like the pinnacle of transatlanticism and and Western traditional foreign policiness, which like Trump does not embody and Biden does. So I think there's a general in, in that sense, more of a gravitation to Biden, but not necessarily in like the political sense, just more in the um, you know, foreign policy orientation. You know, and I, here's how we'll actually close because I can't believe I forgot to ask this. Um, this isn't quite a black swan event because so talking about Taiwan, um, because we we know that there could be an invasion of Taiwan. Biden's Biden and the administration have given contradictory answers on whether or not the United States would intervene in case of an invasion. So it's not a black swan because we know it could happen, but we know there could be a black swan, which we've never seen before, somewhere down uh, the river to mix the metaphors a little bit. Um, where does where do you think the Biden administration comes down on these Taiwan questions? Well, I mean, if you, we've heard Biden three or four times now say, you know, if China invades Taiwan, uh, we're coming. 
uh, we're coming to help. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean just providing? Well, then the key thing is very directly then afterwards, of course, like the NSC right. and the press shop say that basically isn't our position. We still maintain the status quo, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right, right. But I think, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, do a edit around here if you need. I think there was an interview in which I think it was George Stephanopoulos asked Biden was like, does that mean you're sending troops? And Biden goes, yes. Um, so I, I believe at least on one occasion, but it's not general occasions. He said, like, we're coming like China. Don't do it. Otherwise, America is going to get involved. Um, Trump is wants to defend Taiwan. He's he's, you know, he's tough on China. But that's sort of an interesting question is, would he send American troops in to defend uh, Taiwan in that sense? You know, he's not a guy who wants to start a foreign war. We get involved in a big war. He doesn't mind using military force abroad, right? He's already talked about bombing drug cartels in Mexico. And of course, we talked about Soleimani. And of course, oh, I like, forgot all about that news cycle. That was, a, that, was a, that was a week. There was like a week where that was the whole thing. We kind of moved on from that one. Which I, I personally think we should continue to talk about a lot more. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, the, but of course, the, the, the anti-ISIS campaign. So like it's, Trump is not against the use of military force. He just doesn't like big extended foreign mm. operations. Um, which, of course, China trying to take Taiwan would be. So I'm curious how he would react to that. Although I think his his general view would be this is something not something that should happen on my watch. What he does is is unclear. But you know the but so it sounds like Biden's going to do something. My guess is Trump's going to do something, but I just don't know how much. So I but uh, but that's a signal to she and that you'll hear Republicans and Democrats say. Um, speaking more about foreign policy to the middle class in a sense, like another tangible benefit is Xi Jinping is watching, right? He's watching what's happening in Ukraine. And if Putin is pushed back there, then she will think twice about Taiwan, in which case those, that's another war we don't have to send American sons and daughters. And of course, that war could lead to a global economic winter if all the semiconductors that are produced in Taiwan, you know, are destroyed in that factory or China takes it, let's say. Um, and of course, you know, just having a major economy in a war gives everyone the economic flu. So um, in a sense, like you have to win in Ukraine because we want to push off a China-Taiwan situation even further. You can you don't have to buy that, by the way, but you'll hear Democrats and Republicans say that constantly. So anyway, I know I'm a little uh, far away from your original question, but um, I'm, I'm curious. I think I sort of, I think I know where Biden is and I think I know where Trump is, but I think when he, his advisors tell him, hey, you want to push back on China, they shouldn't be doing this, but here's what it's going to take. He, that's what he might go, ooh, you know? <laughs> and that's what I'm curious. You know, I hope we don't have to see that moment, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That would imply there's a, a war, but it is an interesting intellectual exercise to think about that, like just that switch, because that's where I think Trump goes from not worrying about using military force, in fact, being kind of willing to use it to going, oh, wait, I don't want to be involved in that anymore. 100%. That is a perfect place to get in the conversation. Um, Alexander, can you shout out the book that folks can pick up? We're releasing this on publication date, so folks can go to our links and our show notes. Well, great. Well, that means it's coming out uh, February 20th, so you can uh, pick up the book now uh, wherever books are sold, online, at a bookstore, uh, support your local bookstore, support big stores, but you can get it, uh, audio book as well, you know, digital copies, whatever you like, but I hope you read it. I hope you engage with it. It's really meant not to necessarily be like the DC, the typical DC. I mean, I think there are new, there are newsy bits and, and scoopy bits in it, but it's not meant to be like the DC tell all what's going on. It's really meant to start a conversation about, um, you know, two different views on foreign policy and where we're going. And of course I spend the vast majority of the time on Biden, but it's to, exp I think, try to illuminate the moment we're all in. And so therefore I want every citizen to read it and think about it um, in general, but also if you want to consider the foreign policy aspects of an election, like I, this is, I think, as good a primer as you'll find if I may be so bold. Thanks for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me.